every baby's a miracle, but this journey really just taught me. And I think one of the things, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to come on your podcast was I don't think I realized like how you could be inpatient in the hospital for so many weeks waiting for the baby to be born. Like I was in the, patient, the hospital for five weeks, like waiting for my baby to be born. I knew people have like high risk situations and people have preemies, but like I didn't know about this antipartum unit. And I really like the nurses there were amazing. And like, I really got to know them with labor and delivery. It's in and out. You don't really get to develop that connection. Giving birth is one of the most significant events of your life. Sadly, the joy that you should feel can often be replaced with anxiety and helplessness instead. As a labor and delivery nurse, I'm revealing insider information to educate you, reassure you, and decrease your fear. In this podcast, you'll hear empowering birth stories and experts weigh in on a range of topics. Being Jewish also has me exploring Judaism's influence on the reproductive experience. However, I speak to anyone wishing to navigate their journey with more joy and confidence. I'm your host, Hani Fingerer, and you're listening to the Happy Birthway Podcast. Welcome to episode 78 of the Happy Birthway Podcast. For this episode, I am so excited to bring to you another birth story. Those are everyone's favorite episodes. This birth story is quite the contrast from the last birth story I brought to you two episodes ago, which was Raisy's birth story. Raisy's story was quite simple, straightforward, and I got great feedback from you. Very happy to have heard an upbeat, nice story. This story, which is Shoshana's story, is the story that focuses primarily on her second pregnancy and birth. Um, Her first pregnancy and birth was very straightforward and simple. And so the second one, it threw her quite the loop to go through a completely different experience. And I think that this is a great time to highlight the fact that every single pregnancy and birth is so different one from the next. So many times in the hospital, I would hear women talk about their second or third birth and say, oh my gosh, this is so different from what happened with my first and compare to their first birth and tell me what happened with their first birth. And I would just nod in, you know, agreement. Yes, every single pregnancy and birth is different. But even though Shoshana's pregnancy and birth was high risk, there were so many twists and turns. There was so much, you know, some scary news that she got. There was so many things that were indeterminate and unknown. And despite all of that, she had, she came away with a very positive feeling. Um, I think a huge part of that was because she had such a supportive healthcare team like from every single provider that she encountered, she seemed to have just such a wonderful, positive experience. And nothing brings me more joy than to hear that from people, you know, being someone that's part of a birth team. Um, And so I really think that that was a major influencer for how she came out feeling. Um, And I think that she's just a resilient person by nature. And I hope that this will bring some comfort to some of you who are feeling isolated and have had difficult pregnancies, high-risk pregnancies. And those of you who haven't, it's great to listen to this because I think it gives you some perspective of friends or family that may be going through high-risk pregnancies. And for anybody who listens to this story and feels like they want to connect with Shoshana, then by all means, please email me, Hani at yoladidacademy.com. That's C-H-A-N-I-E at yoladidacademy.com. And I will connect you with Shoshana. Without further ado, enjoy this story. Hi, I'm Shoshana, and I am a teacher, a genetic studies teacher. I live in Queens with my husband and now our two daughters. So our first pregnancy was, you know, pretty normal. We got pregnant. We had baby, pretty normal delivery. I mean, I'll, I'll throw in some pieces of it. And then we got pregnant again. I didn't even realize I was pregnant. I thought I got my period. I had what's called implantation bleeding. Implantation bleeding is spotting or bleeding that occurs that when the bee, when the, when the embryo, when the feed, I don't know what, what it is at that stage. Impl- it, yeah. When the embryo implants, implants. It's, called an embryo. Mm-hmm. it's called an embryo in the beginning of the pregnancy. Right. So when it implants um, and it causes some bleeding and that's what happened. And I actually 
thought I got my period and I thought it was weird. So I like, reached out to my doctor. I'm like, I don't know, like it's like not as heavy, but I was still breastfeeding my older daughter. So I was like, maybe it's just related to breastfeeding. My period had been weird for months. And the doctor's like, no, come in. I we want to check it out. And then they told me that I was expecting. And then they did have me do some blood work just to you know make sure that everything was progressing normally. Because sometimes when that bleeding is happening, it could mean that it's going to lead to a miscarriage. But often it just means that the baby's implanting. So she just had me do some repeat blood tests just to confirm that my HCG levels were going up. This pregnancy happens to be my last pregnancy. I also had nausea, very minimal vomiting. This pregnancy, I vomited a lot even into my second trimester and my toddler's diapers would like trigger me. So like my husband had to change the dirty diapers because that was just gross. <laughs> and it would, I would, I would vomit every time. Anyways, this pregnancy, our first pregnancy, we were very like quiet. We didn't like tell anyone we were expecting for a really long time, like past the first trimester screen, like I think maybe even like close to my anatomy scan before we even told even our parents that we were expecting. This pregnancy, we told our parents pretty early, I don't know, like 10 weeks. And then before my, no, it was maybe even earlier than that. And then before my first trimester screening, we ended up telling my siblings because we were by my parents for shops. My brother had just gotten engaged and we were there with his Kala. And my husband's like, I don't want your siblings guessing again this time that you're pregnant. Because my last pregnancy, they guessed before I told them because we waited so long. And he's like, I do not want them guessing again. So we're just going to tell them. And I like, I agreed with him that that was made sense, but we hadn't had the first trimester screening yet. So like, I wasn't so comfortable telling them that because I wanted to like make sure everything was okay. So then I went for that appointment. The way my OB's office does it is they send you to the center for high-risk pregnancy connected to the hospital where we deliver to do ultrasounds. So I go for the ultrasound and with my first pregnancy, it was nothing like did the ultrasound. The doctor came in and said, everything looks good. And that was it. So I didn't expect anything of it. My husband stayed home to watch the baby. My first pregnancy, I dragged him to all these appointments until the one with, because COVID was so bad, they didn't let him in for my anatomy skin. So then after that, he's like, I don't really want to go to these appointments anymore uh, with my first, but this one. So to interject, your first baby was born during COVID times. She was born in May, 2022. So it wasn't quite, but yeah, I I tested positive for COVID during her delivery. So we weren't allowed visitors. So it was COVID. Still in the era of COVID where we were having certain precautions. Yeah. Um, and then, so I went for this appointment alone and I thought like, you know, everything would be fine. And then the doctor comes in and they tell me that the baby has what's called an elevated nuchal translucency. So that's one of the markers that they're checking for in a first, in the first trimester screening is the thickness of the baby's neck. Cause that could be a soft marker for things like Down syndrome or other chromosomal abnormalities. So the doctor told me that the threshold which they look at I don't know, but centimeters, millimeters is three. And my babies was measuring 3.4. So they said it like very minimal, but that we have to be concerned and we should probably do further testing. And they wanted me to speak to a genetic counselor. And mind you, I'm alone at this point because my husband's not, my husband's at home with my baby and it's like really scary. And I don't know, like, whatever. So I went home and I, it wasn't my OB's office either. So I reached out to my OB who is phenomenal from female. And she really went, I loved her even before this pregnancy. Like she helped me with all like, birth control me the spotting stuff after my first baby and like I was her biggest fan club and then uh, this pregnancy she really went above and beyond for me and I am like I have so much a car so I to her so I Can reached you say out her to name her. because I have to tell you I get so many messages asking me for recommendations and I do not give out recommendations but if you had a good experience can you please say her, do you mind saying her name here yeah I can say her name Dr. Esty Hershorn Okay, everyone. Dr. Her practice is called. It's easy, easy to look up. Her practice is called Women for Women. O B G Y N. Women for Women. Excellent. It's so I, nice to hear. I specifically wanted a female practice. My actually, how I came to them was before I got married. My college teacher recommended me a female from gynecologist who doesn't do deliveries. So when I was looking, and we and we moved to Queens, and she's like, "You should deliver in L I J." She's like, "I'll send you somebody," and she sent me this practice, and I didn't even know they had a female a from woman on their team but I specifically wanted female so I joined them and then I discovered so my first pregnancy actually bounced around I she wasn't like my OB like I kind of just bounced around I saw whoever was available when I needed to make an appointment and then also because she had a baby when I was pregnant with my first so she wasn't really around for me to make her my doctor um but then after my first she became my OB and then this pregnancy really I actually only saw her until I ended up in the hospital but we'll get to that um, okay, so Dr. Esty Hirschhorn from Woman to Woman. Guys, if you go to her because of this podcast, just tell her about this podcast. Maybe she'll recommend my podcast to other people. 
Um, make sure I'm maternity leave now also so yeah, sometimes I mean I don't know when the podcast will come out but yeah well um, and even so people listen to episodes a year or two back so right it's true um right so the Nicole so I spoke to her about it and she said that she's had plenty of people who have had this and this was like you know a scare she's like obviously we need to you know do some things so initially we had planned to do the nips because we thought everything was normal she's like you'll just do the nips when you come in for your 16 week visit but at this point we should move up when we do the nips the blood test that checks for that's another check for these same things that the nuchal had us concerned for so i can't i went in the next week and i did and and just to interrupt you to quickly explain to our audience so this is a screening not diagnostic it's a screening and it screens for several different chromosomal abnormalities as Shoshana just uh mentioned and it basically looks at different findings on an ultrasound together with different findings that are taken on a blood test it's screening so cannot definitely rule out everything, but it'll tell you, you know, you have a one in a million chance of having a baby with Down syndrome, which is extremely, extremely, extremely low versus telling you, you have a one in 50 chance of having a baby with Down syndrome, which is much higher. And combined, if both the ultrasound and the blood work are showing up, then that could be concerned. Exactly. Um, So they they take both of those uh, data sets into consideration together. That's important to know. Okay. So then, um, the blood work came back that everything looked like it was low. It was a low threshold. Everything seemed normal. So at that point we decided that we weren't actually going to, we ended up meeting with the genetic counselor, but we decided we weren't going to do any further testing. We actually also spoke to a close family member who in a pre- in their recent pregnancy had had a similar experience. Their nuchal actually measured like five, which is much higher. And they had a healthy baby. So that like for us, once the blood work came back that it wasn't looking as concerning, we were willing to say, okay, we're going to leave it and we're going to move forward. Um, they obviously now we're treating it as a high risk pregnancy. So I had to do a 16 week anatomy scan, an early anatomy scan before the 20 week one. And then they also had us do a fetal echo, but everything was looking good at that point. But when I went for my anatomy scan, they told me that I have what's called placenta previa, which means that my placenta is hanging over my cervix, which means that if the placenta doesn't move, then I'm going to have to have a C-section because the baby can't come out through the cervix if the placenta is hanging over it. Now, the doctor in the Center for High-Risk Pregnancy told me, she said that people get psyched out that they're having the C-section, but they, mon- they continuously monitor to see if the placenta moves. And she said she's had people who come in 36 weeks thinking that they're having a C-section tomorrow and their placenta will have moved. So she told me that as like, you know, a comfort. And when I spoke to my OB about it after, she also told me, she's like, and if your placenta moves slightly even, I would be well in- under an induction, let you try for a for a vaginal delivery and she said and either and also she told me that my practice is very much in favor of doing VBAC so if I end up having to have a c-section we would we would be able to try for a VBAC after so she really comforted me with that so the placenta previa I just want to mention quickly also so there are like you said varying degrees of placenta previa there's a complete previa which is basically you know we are sure like there's the that placenta is not going to move because the placenta might mean move a little bit right but it's still implanted in a specific place and then there's a partial previa, which is not fully blocking the cervix, but it's blocking certain parts of the, you know, a certain amount of the cervix. And as your pregnancy advances, um, the way the the way your placenta, you know, uh, grows, it it's it's not, you know, it's it's may, maybe low lying, it may be lying low close to your cervix, but it's not blocking your cervix. And so at that point, the doctor will give you the go ahead to try for a vaginal delivery. So it's you know it's a spectrum, right? Um, and so that's important for people to know because some people may be told, oh, you have a previa, no chances that your placenta is gonna move. And I don't want people hearing this podcast thinking, well, I heard a story that somebody is placenta moved. There are varying degrees. If someone has a complete uh, previa, that means like that middle of that placenta is smack on top of their cervix, um, you know, and it, it's it's advancing toward the middle to end of the pregnancy. They should just have, you know, I just want a level set so they have realistic understanding and expectations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then one of the things they told me with the placenta previa is they gave me absolutely certain restrictions, but they also told me that it puts me at a higher risk for unexplained bleeding. And if I start bleeding, I have to go to the hospital. And I was davening, please, Hashem, please don't let me have this bleeding. The main cause of bleeding 
when someone has a placenta previa is because the placenta may start to detach, right? Because the cervix is an opening. And so there's an area there that um, the placenta may start to separate from, which is called a placental abruption, which is, which can be extremely dangerous because it cuts off blood supply. I'm sorry, you know, oxygen supply, nutrient supply to the baby if the placenta is not working. Um, and so any small signs of bleeding during a placenta previa are extremely important to get checked down. And that is definitely something that throughout someone having a low-lying placenta, partial, complete previa, we are on the lookout for, um, you know, because it, there is always, there's a higher chance for that when someone has a previa. So they, so uh, then 25 weeks, it was Eric Shabbos was probably like, so this was in August. So like Shabbos was pretty late. Like Shabbos was in the 7.30 range. The 4.30, I discovered that I was bleeding. And now I have a baby who's, She's now 19 months, so she was, I don't know, like 15 months at the time. So, like, it wasn't just like, okay, like, we'll call the doctor and we'll go to the hospital. It's like, and it's Arab Shabbos, so we need to figure out what are we going to do with her before we can even take care of us. We have to, like, figure out what are we going to do with her. So I call my mom, who lives, like, who lives in Woodmere, which is, like, half an hour, 10 hour, depending on traffic. And she's like, okay, I'm getting in the car. I'll come get her. And she called her friend who lives around the corner to come watch my toddler until she got there. And my mother came and like, we packed the bag for the baby for Shabbos, we packed bags for ourselves for Shabbos, but we thought like, this was going to be a quick, like, we'll go to the hospital, let's we'll check it out. We'll send this home. So the bag of our stuff for Shabbos actually mostly went to my parents' house, didn't even end up going with us to the hospital. And um, I spoke to my doctor and it's actually great because I, and it was the doctor's office was already closed. So I called the hop line and then the doctor called me back the doctor called me and she's like and she's like we're gonna be waiting for you and I got to the hospital I, they didn't even make me sit down in triage they like took me straight into a triage room they didn't even like take like they like followed they like had my license still with them when like when I went into a room and they had to, like come find me to give me back my stuff um to get things started and it was also great because it wasn't just like you know the PA or the NP or whatever did like did the speculum exam my doctor was there one of one of the coverings from my, one of the doctors from my practice was there when they did the because it was a friday afternoon so it wasn't dr hershorn wasn't there at that point it was one of the other doctors um that actually really drives home the importance of calling in advance if you can um because we can do a lot of things to prepare beforehand especially when we know what the situation might be you know in your case they may be preparing we always prepare for the worst but you know we would prepare for the worst what if this placenta is in fact detaching and abrupting and this baby needs an emergency c-section we can be on alert for that we can um make sure that we have the staffing for it in case that that's that that situation rises and i Highly encourage anyone, even if you're out of town and you're going to a hospital that you've never been in, but you're having some obstetric emergency, try to find the hospital number and ask them to connect you to the labor and delivery unit. And you can tell them that you're coming in for X, Y, Z. So they have that heads up. So this really just drives home that point. Thank you for mentioning that. It really drives home the point, the importance of calling in advance because it can be time that is on your side. Yeah, so then we got, got to the hospital. They, you know, they did the speculum exam to check and see what things looked like. They, I don't remember if they did, I think they did an ultrasound at that point. I don't remember. But they decided that it looked like it was just a blood clot and that, but still out of precaution in case they would have to deliver, they gave me a beta shot, which is for the baby's lungs, because before 30, 36 weeks, the baby's lungs need extra help developing. And they also gave me magnesium, which is something related to the baby's um, brain, neural. So there's something called neuroprotection. Yes, if a baby is being delivered under 34 weeks, then magnesium is administered and that helps protect the baby's brain. And yes, you got that beta methadone shot, which is a steroid shot to help accelerate baby's lungs. Anyone um, under 30 seven weeks actually now, I believe it is. I have to double check if it's 37 weeks. I think the guidelines went a little bit higher. Um, is given two doses of beta methadone, 24 hours of and so exactly 24 hours apart and we're, we we consider you beta complete um so to speak that means that you got the full effect of the beta methadone by 48 hours after you got that first dose so 24 hours after the second dose is where it's taken the full effect so you know obviously we can't control if a baby needs to be delivered sooner than that but um ideally if your baby has that full 48 hours after the first dose then you have gotten the full effect of of what it's meant to do, which is accelerate your baby's lung growth. And with the magnesium, they warned me, and this is, it was true. So just for anyone who, if you ever experienced that 
one they do like a big burst of it and then they and then they do a slow drip with the big burst that you're gonna be like get really sweaty and hot and like feel like Ooh. and it's actually funny because one of my nurses not during this hospital stay but my next hospital stay she told me she's like I had magnesium before my pregnancies had <laughs> um yeah, it's horrible. And small tips, you can have a washcloth, a cool washcloth to put on your forehead. You can ask for a fan. You can bring your own fan with you. So I always recommend putting a little fan into, you know, to pack along with you to the hospital, whether you're having a normal regular birth or high risk or whatnot. Um, it just comes in handy. And um, you can have some ice chips that you can suck on. But yes, it can. Wow. It, that hot flash. It's like a hot people describe it as a hot flash. And it makes a lot of people feel really crummy. Yeah, no, and then so so this was so basically right. So then after they discovered, I think they decided that they thought it was a blood clot, but they wanted to make sure I was beta complete. So they ended up keeping me over shops. Before shop, right before shop started, they moved us from like triage into PACU, which is like the pre-operating situation. PACU two became a very good friend of ours. We spent a lot of time in that room, so we spent actually the whole rest of Shabbos there because they didn't have any open rooms on the antepartum unit at the time, so they just kept us there. And then after I had the second dose, at like I don't know, it was like after Shabbos, it was like late. They like let us go at like ten p.m. Like it was just like till they like got discharged out or whatever, but like. But we spent the rest of the Shabbos there. Most of the morning, I was still NPO because they thought they still might have to do a C-section. And then the MFM, the maternal fetal medicine doctor, who's associated with the Center for High Risk Pregnancy. It wasn't one that I had previously met, but because different doctors are in the hospital versus there. But one of their doctors came in and she did a, a vaginal ultrasound just to confirm what they had seen on the abdominal ultrasound on Friday. And she confirmed that it was a that it was just a blood clot. And then they said once I had second beta that I would be able to go. And at that point they took me off the IV and I was allowed to eat. Okay, so that was that. And when you said NPO going back, that means for everyone who doesn't know nothing by mouth and before surgery, you should be fasting for at least six hours before. So um, that's what Shoshana means when she says NPO. And I'm going to say it again. It's going to come back up. All right. So then we went home and my husband was actually very nervous when we went back. It happens to be, I had a doctor's appointment scheduled with Dr. Hirshhorn that week because it was supposed to have it at 24 weeks, but she had been on vacation. So my, 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 I was like a week at that point doesn't make a difference. Like, it's not like they need to do the scan by this date or whatever. I'm like, and I wanted to talk to her before Yom Kippur. Cause this was like at the end of August, I wanted to talk to her before Yom Kippur about me fasting for Yom Kippur. And I specifically wanted to talk to her and not one of the non from doctors in the practice or the non Jewish or whatever. So I had moved the appointment, which ended up being good. Cause they're like, when are you going to follow up? I'm like, I have an appointment with this with Dr. Hirshhorn on Tuesday. They're like, great. So my husband was actually nervous about now Yontif coming up. His parents live in Teaneck and he was nervous. Like, can, if, if there's a risk of this happening again, like, can we go to his parents for Yontif? But Dr. Hirshhorn thought we could, as long as we knew where there was a nearby hospital, if hospital and something happens, that we could go to. Um, Baruch Shem, we made it through Yontif, no problem. And then Rosh Chodesh Chashan, um, Sunday morning. So my husband's Chavrusa had had a baby like right after Rosh Hashanah and their baby was in the NICU for a few weeks and he had just come home and his bris was Sunday morning, Rosh Chodesh. And we went to the bris and then Sunday night I started bleeding again. So we had to go to the hospital again. This time one of my cousins had just gotten married and she lives on our block. So I called her and she came to stay with my baby until, who was already asleep, like this was at night. So she was, my baby was already sleeping. Um, she came to stay with her until my parents could get there to get her to get my daughter. Um, and we thought like, like the previous time we would go to the hospital. We knew that if we were admitted again, that maybe they would keep me a little longer for observation. Like it wouldn't be just the 24 hours till I got the data. Like they might keep me 48 hours after that to observe and make sure. But we thought we were going to the hospital and like probably we would get sent home again. Um, we got to the hospital. Um, this time, one of the cover, my practice has four doctors who do deliveries, and then they have two other doctors who cover them. So one of the other coverings is on. So I actually didn't see a doctor even that night. I just saw whoever was in, you know, triage, the PA, the nurses, and they started me on the same, you know, they actually, we were, I was curious, I was like, are they going to do the beta and the magnesium again? Like, I was like, I had already done this, but they did. They said it was enough weeks later that they wanted to do it, to do a repeat of it and make sure like everything would be okay for the baby. They said you can yeah, get sometimes beta. they'll give a rescue beta shot, a third one, just you know, when delivery is imminent, they'll give one more. It actually did mean for me the two, the two 24 hour. They said that you can have it up to twice during your oh, pregnancy. Okay, okay, there you go. 
because I asked I was like because at that point also like I was like I still thought I was getting sent home like I wanted to know like what was like their protocol they said you can get it up to twice during the pregnancy Mm -hmm. um and then they moved us into PACU at some point I don't remember exactly when um and I'm still NPO and we're you know waiting to see what's going to happen the next morning they did an ultrasound and we thought that after the ultrasound they were going to be able to send us home after you know the 24 hour the whatever the observation and then in comes the MFM with a whole group of residents and fellows like a ton of them like for a lot of them are like uh oh like what's going on like this is like we were a discovery they just dis- had discovered that the baby had fluid around her well we didn't know yet at this point it was a girl we actually and I was actually annoying I'm like I don't know what I'm having and I don't want you to tell me because they were doing like these ultrasounds and for a few days we were doing that um so um but around her lungs and abdomen they discovered that she had fluid around it which is medically they call that high drops it's like accumulations of fluid around the baby and I also had an extremely elevated amount of fluid around the, the baby like in my in my uterus yeah, just, that's fluid yeah, there was an elevated amount of amniotic fluid. Like the normal range is somewhere between five and twenty-five, and I was measuring somewhere in the thirties. Like, and that's called polyhydramnios. Wow, that I never got that word, but I, I knew well, that that we was usually call it poly for short. <laughs> yeah, but I knew that I had elevated fluid, which was a swimming pool. Which actually, fun fact, makes for very good three D image um, ultrasound <laughs> pictures, baby. Um. That There's was, the well, silver was, lining, bright side. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute pictures, my baby. Um, and sometimes we don't know what the reasons are for that. I just want to say sometimes it, it it's just you know it just it just happens. Um, sometimes it's a result of either a swallowing issue or some kidney issue or something else. But sometimes it's just it just happens. Right. So the baby had this fetal high drops, the, the the fluid around her lungs and her abdomen. So they were very worried about her and they thought that they were going to have to do an emergency section, especially because I had had a follow-up ultrasound at, I don't remember how many weeks, it was right before Rosh Hashanah. So it was after my first hospital visit um, where they were just checking to see had the previa moved or not. So, and at that point there was no fluid. So in their heads, they're like this fluid around the baby accumulated very quickly. So they were very concerned. Number one, high drops can be very concerning. It can lead to a very sick baby. And number two, they were like shocked at how quickly it had accumulated. And they were afraid that if they let the baby stay in me any longer, it was going to accumulate even more. But they obviously had to give me the um, 48 hours, the, the 24 hours till I got the beta. And so, and Dr. Hershorn actually was on call that day. And she came in to speak to us after the MFM team had come in. And she actually apologized to me because I had asked her if I could see one of the other doctors in the practice, like the previous week, I'd asked her if I could make my next appointment with one of the other doctors who does deliveries because she was the only one who I hadn't like previously like had a good report with. One of the other ones had delivered my older daughter and one of the other ones was the one who was there in triage that first time we went to the hospital. So there was one doctor who, had, who just had been a bad appointment during my first pregnancy. And I was like, I just wanted to meet her again so that I would feel confident with her. And Dr. Hershorn said she begged the MFM to say, like, at, like she's like, I'll, she's like, I'm on call till midnight. She's like, and if she gets the last, the beta dose, and then I'll do the delivery right after. And he's like, no, I don't want you doing this high risk delivery at that point anyway. It's like, no, it's going to have to wait at least till tomorrow. But she really just wanted to be there for me. And like, and she felt so bad because the other doctor that I had asked her about was on call the next day. And she felt so bad that like, now after all that, like, she's like, I should have let you see her last week. Um, but Baruch Hashem, the baby wasn't born for weeks after. So in the end, that, that didn't end up happening. But then, so their plan is for an emergency C-section. But one of, the, so then they send in the NICU team to talk to us to like, help us understand like, what's going on with me? What's going to be if the baby's born tomorrow? Like, what is this going to look like? The 30, number one, there's a 31 week baby which has lots of concerns in the NICU. And then there's the high drops, which adds to it, which means like a very sick baby is really scary. And like, in case we didn't really understand that when Dr. Hirschman came back to visit us later that night, like she was still on in the hospital and she came to visit us and like, she looked like she was ready to cry about like what was things were going to be for our baby who Baruch Hashem, she's now eight weeks old today and she's doing really well. She's home, been home for five weeks and she's Baruch Hashem, durable, really healthy baby. But at that point, like it was really scary. Like, and like, we were just like scared. We still like, didn't know what's going on. Like it was just like scared, but like, there was also this piece of like, not, at this point I was also in, in, in an antepartum room, that room 409, which became like my home for the next five weeks. Um, but like Dr. Hershon looked like she was ready to cry. And that was like, for us, like, oh my gosh, like 
something really sad or scary is going to happen. Like until then, like we were like, yes, yeah, so they discovered something like this is going to happen. But like everyone's like, you know, being optimistic, trying to make us see if, and like Dr. Hirschhorn just like helped us like understand reality. So then the next day they did a, another ultrasound because obviously they weren't delivering me yet. And one of the things the NICU team had suggested is they thought maybe it would be helpful if we can try in utero to drain the fluid that's around the baby's lungs because then they could test it and see what is possibly causing it. And that could give them more information. Also, at this point, they had us do a lot of genetic testing, which is a little, our baby is like a bit of a mystery, is all the genetic testing we did came back negative for anything that could have caused this. They have no idea. And they did genetic testing and on the baby in utero and on carrier skinning on me and my husband. And they did extensive genetic testing after she was born. And they have no idea what caused any of this. Um, so they're attempting to drain the fluid in utero. And... So the doctor comes, so first they were, it was like a, maybe we should do this. Then the NICU team was strongly encouraging it. So I was like, okay, then let's go for it. So the MFM comes in and he tries to do it, but he doesn't have his, all his like fellows and residents with him to help him with it. And he, he does the ultrasound to see like where the baby's positioned and the baby had, because in the morning when they did the ultrasound, the baby was in the right position for them to be able to do it. But when he came back, the baby had moved. And so then he came back again a while later and the baby had moved had not had still not moved and he couldn't do it my mother kept saying at the time and like it, it didn't feel like this for me but my mother kept saying she's like we were davening and Hashem decided that this was not needed to happen um but like for us it's like this is what they medically said the baby needed so like we were like even though it obviously opposed a risk of when if they were putting a needle into me they opposed a risk of rupture and that they, the baby would just have to come out that day anyway but it might have bought them some time but like for me it was like this didn't happen and it just felt like but this needed to happen. Like it was really scary, but my mother was right. Hashem really was like looking out for us because the next morning, doc, the next day, Dr. Hashem called me, they had a big, like the MFM and the OB teams like had their meetings about all their cases. And one of the things that was decided at that time was that it was not wise to try to drain fluid while in utero. So in the end, Hashem was really looking out for us in that they hadn't done it the day before. And that's an important point really to highlight. Medicine is so imperfect it's really imperfect. And we try to do the best we can with the information that we have. But ultimately, at the end of the day, this is really where the Amuna and Bitachon comes in and trusting in Hashem to guide the medical team to make the right decisions. And Hashem really just guided your medical team like that. Hashem. Um, so now, in the meantime, while this is going on, basically, is they for that week, the first week that we were there, they treated it every day as if today is going to be the day of the C section. So they would make me after midnight. I would go MPO, and they were putting me on the mo- on the baby on the monitor, on the NST, the monitor that they do in every labor. You know, the at that point, I think they were doing the contraction and the heartbeat, mo- the heart rate monitor, and they would put the monitor on the monitor. I think three times a day. I think at that point already it was just three times a day. It's supposed to be for twenty minutes at a time, but ends up being hours at a time because maybe would not give them what they wanted. Um, so for the first week, every day I went MPO in the morning and then they would, and then they would, um, and then they would do the ultrasound and they would be like, okay, it hasn't gotten worse. So therefore we're not going to deliver you today. So we're going to do this again tomorrow. By the end of the week, they decided that things had stayed stable all week, that now we're going to move to a, we're going to do a daily ultrasound and we're going to do the monitoring daily, but we're not actually going to make you go MPO because now our goal is to get you, because now if it's not accumulating faster in utero, then it's better for the baby right now to be in, inside of you and to keep growing with constant monitoring than for us to take the baby out and have to deal with the high drops as well as a, as a extreme cream. So that was what they decided. One day that week, Oh, so then I think at the, by the end of that week, we had decided that my husband's like, if we're dealing with a baby, that's going to be very sick. Like we were been like, we don't want to know what we're going to have. But he's like, but maybe we should find out what we're having. Because number one, they're doing these ultrasounds every day. So somebody's going to slip. So let's instead let, let, let's have them tell us. And he also said like, if the baby's going to be sick, then maybe we should like, and they're going to whisk the baby off to the NICU. Um, Then maybe we should have a moment to celebrate now what we're having, as opposed to like having that moment in labor and delivery. Um, like we had with our older daughter. Um, so one day that the following, when we're just kind of in status quo of, you know, we're doing the um, daily monitoring and ultrasound, the doctor decided that I needed to, the baby had a deacceleration, the heart rate had gone down. And now this happens, like maybe like rolls into its umbilical cord, but I don't, we didn't necessarily know at that point that this happens. We slowly learned. 
Um, and he decided that he wanted me to stay on the monitor until the ultrasound had been done. Now, normally most days that week, they had done the ultrasound by like 10 a.m. So that doesn't sound so bad if I went on at seven, like a little before seven, like it's not so bad. But that day, the, they didn't come to do my ultrasound until 2.30 in the afternoon. So like I'm lying in bed. I'm freaking out because like, I don't know what's happening with this baby. Like it could be that they're going to decide to have to deliver. My husband had to go to school. I like, made somebody like stay with me the, like the whole day. Like my dad had like every day, I guess I forgot to mention this. They were, once we had been admitted to a room in antepartum, they let my toddler come visit every day. So my, she, I work in her tour, which is a school not far from the hospital LIJ where I delivered. And um, so, and they have daycare care for teachers, children. So my daughter was going to daycare every day. My parents would bring her to visit me in the hospital and then the ho- hospital's 10 minutes from school. And then they would take her to school. So she would come visit me almost every morning. Um, so my father came in when they, when I'm still on the monitor and they like were freaking me out that they have to stay on the monitor. And I was like, I need somebody to stay with me. My husband had to go to school. He's in law school. And my father's like, okay, I'm going to drop her off. And then I'm going to come back and sit with you. In the meantime, one of my friends showed up. And in the end, my father didn't even have time to sit with me because my friend sat with me and then my aunt was coming. So I ended up sending my father home. But, and then the next day he decided he had to come sit with me again because he was scared. He was worried about me, which was very nice of him, but like a little annoying because he's just sitting in my room and I didn't need him sitting there. Can I just stop you for one moment and just give you credit for how much you had going on then? I don't know if you've actually even processed how much you had going on. You had a little toddler baby, literally a tiny little baby under two years old. You were inpatient, stuck in the hospital for weeks at a time with, you know, worry and uncertainty. Your husband was in law school, which is so demanding and wow, that is a lot. I think when you're in it, you don't really maybe grasp the intensity of it. But I, I just need to stop right here and just hold a minute for you to tell you that is amazing. That is incredible. Thank you. You know, it was it was crazy. Um, and then yeah, and it was just took forever till they actually did the ultrasound. The day everything was far from fine, and then things continued. Um, and then Friday that week, I woke up to bleeding. So they freaked out and they sent me back to PACU. I think somewhere actually before that, they had done a vaginal ultrasound, before the bleeding even, they had done a vaginal ultrasound just to check on the placenta. And they had said it had moved. It was only like 0.8 centimeters away from my cervix now. So like we were doing that. I started bleeding again. And so they freaked out and they sent me back to PACU. But and then while we're in PACU, this is like a little nerve wracking because they're like, so my husband, we need you to pack out the room in the antepartum. But the MFM had told me, he's like, he's like, we're making you wait till 36 weeks unless something changes on the ultrasound with the baby. You're making it till 36 weeks. So we're going to send you back upstairs. Like he didn't even like keep me MPO for that long. Um, and, uh, and, but like, it was like really nerve wracking because like we know we're going back upstairs, but like they're like being annoying and they kept telling my husband, Daddy, we need you to come back upstairs and pack up just for like hospital bureaucracy. In the end, he like half packed the room and then they like and then the doctor interceded and he didn't actually have to finish packing it up. And also this is Friday. So like he was planning to go home and take a shower before Shabbos. And then like he was stuck with me, like, you know, just being my support person because I needed him at that point. But Baruch Hashem, we went back to the room and he had enough time to go home and shower before Shabbos and come back. Um, and I even got to see my daughter that day. So that was good. But then they did another vaginal ultrasound. After that bleed, they did another vaginal ultrasound the next week. And they found that my placenta had completely moved. So now the plan moving forward, yeah, they're going to make me get to 36 weeks. But now instead of emergency C-section, now the plan is an induction, which is what I wanted all along. Which is like, you know, like that took like, even if we're dealing with a sick baby, like Mir Tashem, like I would be able to have a vaginal delivery, which would mean that when we're going to the NICU, that at least I would be able to, you know, walk and stuff which wouldn't be as like crazy as you recovering from major surgery yeah it just makes it more complicated with you know mobility and getting you down there in the first few days so definitely yeah. you know Thank you. that that's preferable <laughs> if possible obviously if possible um and then like as like the, the preview results and then like the things are stable so then they like the, obviously they, they continue monitoring me but they move it to twice a day for an hour at a time and they only do ultrasounds every other day because things really have stayed stable for a while and then we get to 35 weeks they schedule my my induction and then my husband's cousin had a baby on and my husband really 
was incredible the entire time through all this. There was one night the entire time I was, and I was in the hospital for five and a half weeks. There was one night that he didn't stay with me. And that was because his cousin had a baby on Shabbos and he wants to go to the bris. And I, at first I wasn't sure emotionally I could handle it, but my mom said she would come for Shabbos. And in the end, I decided that my husband needed to go to this bris and that I would stay with my mom for Shabbos. So that's the only night he didn't spend with me the entire time in the hospital. Now, four o'clock Friday afternoon, this is the first early Shabbos. The, um, the MFM comes in to do my ultrasound. And he, the, it's a team of MFMs. Every day it's a different doctor and they have different opinions. And as Dr. Hershorn reminded me, she's like, they're consultants. Ultimately, I'm your doctor and I make the decision, but they're the high risk doctors. So they're the ones who they're, she's consulting with and they're a team. So the one who comes in this day goes, because you're doing so well. He's like, I'm thinking that maybe we should send you home and not even aim for 36 weeks, like aim for 37 or even after. And I'm like, what? You kept me here for this long and now you're going to do this. My mother's like, Hashem's going to send this a sign. It's going to be fine. And like, and just Friday night, I started bleeding again. So there went, there they're was like, your yeah, sign. no, we're, we're going to wait. I mean, it's still had another week to go. This is like 13, like 35 weeks. But like, they're like, yeah, no, now this is my sign. We're going to, we're going to keep you um, here. Okay. Now, now let's get to my delivery. Um, so their plan is for an induction. Um, so they started me on side attack at, around 2 a.m. So they moved me down from antepartum to to labor and delivery around like 11 p.m. And let's just backtrack. For your first birth, you had a normal vaginal delivery that was uncomplicated, uneventful. I had a normal vaginal delivery. However, however, I did have where they gave me Pitocin to augment because my contractions were not frequent enough. And the doctor had to break my waters. So in my head, the only thing that was different about this story, at least from the like outset, and I had an epidural, whatever, the only thing that was at the outset was that we were starting with the side attack. I wasn't walking in with... In labor. So, and side attack is a dev- um, an agent used to ripen the cervix so that you can start with Pitocin. And for anybody, I'm, I'm not going to get into this in depth because I have an entire two episodes. You can look back on Pitocin part one and part two, and you'll learn that in detail over there. Um, so this, it was like this pill that I had to like keep under my tongue and let it dissolve for like, I don't remember how many minutes, and then I could finally swallow it. Um, and so they did it around 2 a.m. and then they did a second dose around 5 a.m. And then Dr. Hershorn was coming on at around eight, and then she... Um, and one of the other, one of my other OBs, cause while I was upstairs in antepartum and all this was going on every day, one of my OBs would come in and check on me, whether it was the one from the ones from my practice or their coverings would come in and check on me. And we would talk about like how things are going and they would give me updates and I would ask them questions. So one of my OBs, the, actually the one who had delivered my older daughter, Abigail, she told me in terms of the induction, she recommended letting she said she asked me if I want to get an epidural and I said yes actually this time I want I needed to get an epidural because I knew there was still a chance we might have to pivot to a c-section so I needed to get this epidural because I needed to be it to be that they could just if we had to pivot to c-section that they could just do a c-section but, it's going to save time yeah. yep it's going to save time she said to me she said that she recommended we not starting with the epidural but waiting until I'm feeling the contractions so that we know that the epidural is actually working so we started on the side attack and then like when they started saying Pitocin I'm like okay now I need to get the epidural that was my plan um and I actually did not remember from my first delivery how uncomfortable the placement of the epidural was and if I hadn't known that I needed to get the epidural in this delivery I'm not sure if I would have made it through because that anesthesiologist was really bugging me and like I'm very ticklish and like my reflex then he was getting really annoyed at me and like if I hadn't known that I needed to do this, I'm not sure if I would have stuck with that, at least at that point in time. Um, so I got the epidural around 9.30 a.m. And then after that, they started the Pitocin. Um, around 10.45, when they checked me, I was at two centimeters. Around 11.45, I thought my water might have broken, which was a whole thing because I had the polyhydroaminos, whatever. Is that what you said it was called? Polyhydroaminos, yeah. yep. Um my doctor said like that she had to break my water and not with the big hook that they normally use with something smaller. And they have to like hold it down to like slowly let it so it didn't gush and then cause like an abruption. Yeah. Because it can cause major decompression, like a very fast, you know, pressurized, a different pressurized environment in the uterus, but because there's more water there. And so, yes, there is something to having a kind of like a, a slower, um, more controlled depressurizing of the uterus because it can increase the risk for 
placental abruption among one of those things, yes. And also, you know, some cord issues for the baby. Um, so sometimes doctors do prefer, and again, it really depends on so many other characteristics of the polyhydramnios. But yes, yeah, sometimes doctors will prefer that they manually break the water and they control the amount that's coming out that it's slow, not that it's like a massive gush of a, a, a large amount of pressure, right, you know, in 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 such a small amount of time. But now, anyway, I felt a gush of something. So I thought that maybe my water was breaking at that point. Um but at 11, around 11.45, but it turns out that I was bleeding again. So at mm. this point, my OB ordered blood work. She's like, we need to make sure everything's okay. She's like, because this could be mean that we need to just pivot to C-section at this point. But it turns out that whatever she was looking for was fine and we were able to continue. And I should mention, my labor and delivery nurse was incredible. It was this from girl who I actually knew from like previous like, point in life she had come up to antepartum and she'd been my nurse one day in antepartum when they had like sent when they had floated her up to antepartum and then she had been floated back up to antepartum like the week before my delivery and I was like oh they're inducing me like whatever she's like oh I'm on do you want me to ask to be your nurse so she was my nurse and she was training in another nurse there were these two amazing nurses and so I had Dr. Hershorn my from OB and my from nurse it was amazing like, you had the Jew crew yep <laughs> excellent <laughs> It was actually one of the MFMs also was a from female and um, we, she actually we let her use our bathroom on Shabbos because she was saying how like it's hard for her to, like, she can do these ultrasounds on Shabbos when she's on call but she couldn't use the bathroom because all the bathrooms in the hospital are automated the but we had like we had like taped the lights and everything um, and one of the fellows was also female so there was like one day where I had another Jew crew party it was fun um, that's so fun and then so they broke so and then doctor so in the end we continued they Dr. Hirschman broke my water at around twelve fifty five it turned one of the other OBs was. Um, and my practice does other like sur surgeries in the hospital. And she was in the hospital. And so she came and helped Dr. Hirschhorn with helping allow my slow release of my fluid. Um, around 320, when they checked me, I was about five centimeters dilated and they increased the pitocin. I think it was after this. It might've been before this at some point. I developed this cough and I was having trouble breathing. I don't know what's going on. And they had to like put an oxygen mask and they actually gave me a shot to stop the contraction just so that my body could relax before they like, could start the pitocin again. And then there was like hospital bureaucracy they, because of this cough, which I think was developed actually from the oxygen. I just wanted a cough drop, but like so they had to put it through as a prescription. So it took like an hour until I actually got that cough drop. At 4.30, it was eight centimeters dil dilated. And then basically the plan all along because we knew the baby was going to the NICU was that they were going to deliver me in the OR because the NICU, the hospital where I delivered is there's the women's hospital and then there's the children's hospital. And there's like a, path like between so the NICU has a connection to by the OR because most of their patients who need to be whisked off to them are c-section so they had, the plan was to deliver me in the OR right next to where the NICU has a little setup in the NICU in the OR like next to the OR to take and then to take care of the baby so around like 4 45 they started bringing me to the OR to so that when I was ready to start pushing I'd be able to start pushing and then I remember that the OR was freezing and then they had me move to the operating table to start pushing and like that was like really uncomfortable and I don't know what happened exactly there but they ended up giving me another shot to stop the contractions at that point just to like let me relax let, I don't know if it was on me or on the baby to relax again and then like a half an hour later they like then they started up with Tosin again and then like a half an hour later we were ready to start pushing and the pushing was so intense like I don't remember it being that intense from my older daughter, like I remember my older daughter, like we were pushing and then the doctor's like, you're doing so well, you're doing so well. And then she was born and my husband and I were like, what? Like, we did not think like, we thought they were just like cheerleading us. Like, and like Dr. Hershey and I was just like, how long did you push without a guy? Like, it was like not long, it was like less than a half an hour. And like, this is like, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. And like, as I'm getting to a point where I'm, I'm like, I'm not sure how much longer I can do this. Like, I know I wanted the vaginal delivery, but I'm not sure that I can do this for much longer. That's so ironic and surprising because everything, you know, there can always be wrenches, but you were having a smaller baby, right? A preemie. And it was not your first already. So yeah, that I can understand why they were surprised. But I think it was that was 36 weeks and she wasn't ready to come in. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Shana ends up doing an episiotomy and she kept saying, she's like, I haven't done an episiotomy in like three years. She's like, and then this baby made me do one. <laughs> but like Baruch Hashem, she did that at that point because I'm not sure if I could have gone on pushing for much longer, but because she caught me, she was able to get the baby, with that push, the baby was able to come out. And so I had my vaginal delivery so yes I had this and then she came out and we were very worried about her and she cried right away 
like because we knew there was fluid wow. by her lungs and i feel like dr her which i did cry like, like we were all were like and then they oh, like oh what a journey to have gotten there they got there and then they whisked her off to the NICU my husband like followed but it was actually really nice after they did like their initial like whatever they brought her back and just like like stroke her before like, they took her uh-huh. to the NICU so how many weeks was she 36, at that time 36 and one Wow. So you made it past 36 weeks. That's beautiful. Yeah, no, Bar Hashem. Um, and she was born at, around 6.30. Um, and she cried. It was, like, so beautiful. And, like, Dr. Hirshhorn was, like, really just amazing. After she stitched me up, she gave me, like, a huge hug. Just, like, the extra, you know, human touch. And, like, she knew my husband couldn't hug me at the yeah. time. And, like, she was just, like, really went above and beyond this, like, with this whole thing. That's so beautiful. Bar Hashem. And... It was just like the whole NICU thing, the baby being whisked off. It was like a little surreal. It was like my mother-in-law like spent time with the baby before I did because like I decided that like that night I was just gonna take the time to recover for myself and like get pumping like started and that like the next morning I went to meet her. Like actually middle of the night. It was like five a.m. to meet her. But like it was just like a little that was like a little surreal, but like it's just the whole thing was just quite a journey and it was really just like crazy. How did she do in the NICU? She was in the NICU for she was on off. So they put her on CPAP right away. Um, but they actually were able to lower that. And like by the second day, it was actually able to put her to breast. Um, she was on oxygen for like two and a half weeks. When they tried to lower it, they had to re-raise it. But then eventually they took her off and then she was able to rush her home. And thank God now she's really doing amazing. Like all her follow-up appointments have really just been incredible. Um, it turns out that the, the fluid that was around, they thought was around her abdomen was around her kidney, but they put her on amoxicillin and that resolved for Hashem. And like really thank God she's doing great. Other than like keeping us up at night, wow. she does not like to be put down. So she'll only sleep if somebody's holding her. <laughs> She's drama queen. Yep. She is a drama queen. You know, she doesn't make anything simple no. for you. Maybe <laughs> Yochaved, or as my toddler calls her, Chaved. Yochaved Hodaya. We named her Yochaved Hodaya. We added the Hodaya to think Hashem, just like with all that we went through, like how like amazing she's been doing, and we're so grateful for our little miracle. Every baby's a miracle, That's but like this journey really just taught me like really like really had a journey yeah, it was really yeah. a journey and I think one of the things and one of the reasons why I really wanted to come on your podcast was I think that one of the things like I listened to all these birth stories but I don't think I realized it's like how you could be inpatient in the hospital for so many weeks waiting for the baby to be born like I was in the, patient, the hospital for five weeks like waiting for my baby to be born and like I don't think I realized that that was like a thing like I knew like people have like high risk situations and people have preemies and like whatever but like I don't I didn't know about this antipartum unit and like I really like the nurses there were like amazing and like I really got to know them and I feel like with labor and delivery it's like in and out like you don't really get to develop that connection in the same way which is also why like my labor and delivery nurse who I like had had that connection with from like when she'd been my nurse in antipartum and like because I knew her a little bit before um was like really nice but like in antipartum like I got to really and I was there for so many weeks I really got to know the nurses like my my toddler knew some of the nurses by name yeah, no, it's really special. I worked um, the last unit I worked on, we had a mix, some hospitals, especially the bigger ones, they'll have two separate units. We had all of the patients all in one labor and delivery and the antipartum. And those patients that we had inpatient for a long time for weeks at a time, you know, we would make them parties and get to know their kids and decorate their rooms. And, and it was so, so special, those deliveries. They were really so, so special. You know, I sent them an email, like, a few weeks ago, like, just, like, with, like, pictures of the baby. Like, I want them to, like... Think yeah, like- yeah, and we'll keep in touch with those patients. And it's so meaningful because we're actually front and center to their journey. We really witness it firsthand. So, you know, I'm so grateful that you came on because you have quite a story. And it's very important for women other women who are going through things to hear this story and no woman is going to have an identical story but it's very important for women who are going through maybe a scary pregnancy a high-risk pregnancy for one reason or another to hear stories like yours thank you so much Shoshana for coming for on for sharing on. this crazy roller coaster yeah, of a story. story and I'm happy that I was able to tell you my story Thanks for tuning into the Happy Birthway Podcast. Head over to Your Wedded Academy on Instagram to continue the conversation. You'll find the link in the episode show notes, as well as links to any additional resources, products, and services mentioned here. If you love listening to this show, you can help it grow by sharing it with your friends and rating and reviewing it. To stay in the loop when new episodes are released, make sure to subscribe. Remember that your health needs are unique and require individualized medical advice. 
The podcast is not a replacement, and some of the information may not be appropriate for your specific circumstances. My mission is to educate you so that you can confidently collaborate with your healthcare team. I believe that a healthy mom and healthy baby are simply not enough. We also need a happy mom with an empowering birth experience. 